So we're all done with our eight-week membership class talking about some of our doctrinal di distinctives and, and what it means to be a Reformed Baptist church. And now we're going to do a few one-offs. Uh, not exactly a one-off because this one is a three-part, but we're going to look at certain topics, certain historical issues, and um, I, I hope this is something that is fun for you guys because we've talked a whole lot about doctrine and what we believe, but I thought in the next three weeks it would be great to take one of those things that, that we cherish, and that is the doctrines of grace, and I want us to see it in church history. I want us to be able to look at church history, and although we're not going to find a church that is identical to us, um, you know, things have changed throughout church history. There's not been a perfect theologian who has ever lived. We will have differences. Um, we might get things wrong, and we hope that God would correct us. But when it comes to something as important as the doctrines of grace, you better be sure that you will find this believed and taught throughout church history. So here's a bit of an introduction to this three-part series. Were the doctrines of grace believed and taught before John Calvin in the 16th century? Ask yourself that question. Were the five points as we know them today, a novel invention popularized by the Synod of Dort in, in 1618 or 1619? Well, in this series, we will uncover a continuity of thought from the early church all the way up to the Reformation, testifying of the historical pedigree of what we believe about salvation. The doctrines of grace as explained in the pages of scripture were believed and taught by many. And if you want to book, bookend it, you might say from Clement to Calvin. That is from the early church to the Reformation church. I want us to have confidence that what we believe didn't just pop out out of nowhere a few hundred years ago. I want us to have confidence that this is not a novel teaching, that this is historic Christian doctrine. So today we're going to look at the early church fathers. We're going to look at a few examples of the early church fathers. That's from 100 to 500 AD, the type of things that they taught Week two, next week, we'll look at the medieval leaders. This is a huge chunk of church history from 500 to 1500, around that time. And then on the third week, of course, we'll look at the Protestant reformers. Um, that's the 1500s onwards. Now, as we go through these early church fathers, the medieval leaders, the Protestant reformers, I warn you, we're going to do a fair bit of quoting. We're going to read a lot of quotations, okay? I'm going to try to make it as dynamic as possible, but this is what we need to do if we want to do this kind of study. Uh, we don't want to uh, base what we're teaching and what we're studying right now off of hearsay. We want to hear it from the horse's mouth. We want to hear what these guys actually taught. What did these guys actually believe? And I want to remind us once again that you're not going to find a systematized five points doctrines of grace in the first five centuries of the church. That was not the issue, that they, that, that one of the big issues they were dealing with at that time. Although once we get to a guy named St. Augustine, Yes, you start seeing that kind of formulation. You'll notice that in church history, oftentimes doctrinal formulation arose reactively. What that means is some crazy teaching would pop up, some heresy would sneak in, so therefore the theologians of the church would go and write treatises against those things, and from there you would see basically what we would call today systematization of doctrine, or systematic theology. Okay, so that's usually the context in which these guys would write their theological positions. They were fighting against a lot of false teaching. And look, you can't blame them and say, why didn't you write out the five points so clearly in the first five centuries of the church? Well, again, there's a mixture in beliefs. There's diversity in beliefs. You know, they're not, we're not identical to them. We have to admit that. And at the same time, they were dealing with, they had larger fish to fry, to put it another way. They were dealing with issues like the deity of Christ and stuff like that. Nevertheless, we see the seeds of the doctrines of grace. And ultimately, our confidence is not in the fact that some great guy in church history taught these doctrines. Remember, 
our confidence in the fact that this is what is taught in Scripture. That's where our confidence lies, in the Word of God. But if it is in the Word of God, again, you better believe that men throughout church history caught on to that. They saw that. They held to the teachings of Paul, to the teachings of Peter, and in small forms, in bits and pieces, we will see that they taught and believed in different parts of church history what then came to be known as the doctrines of grace. So a quick recap, what are we talking about here? The five points of Reformed theology. I put a picture there, and you might remember that picture. We're talking about what is today known by the acronym TULIP. Total depravity, that is, man, because of his sinful nature, is born into this world morally corrupt and enslaved to sin, and is both unwilling and unable to turn to Christ in repentance and faith. Unconditional election. God's sovereign choice of His people from before the foundation of the world is not dependent upon man's decision or will, but only upon God's free grace. Limited atonement. God's design and intent in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was to pay for the sins and secure the redemption of only those whom God had predetermined to save. Irresistible grace. God, by the Holy Spirit, effectually calls and saves sinners by grace so they are irresistibly brought to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And lastly, perseverance of the saints. Those who are truly saved will persevere to the end. One who is truly saved cannot somehow lose their salvation. God will preserve them. And yes, you will know them by their fruit. Now, this systematization of what we call the doctrines of grace, uh, historically speaking, was most clearly put forth by what's known as the Synod of Dort. And we have today what we call the canons of the Synod of Dort. They didn't use the acronym TULIP because that is modern English, but they had what we call the five points. The Synod of Dort happened in 1618 to 1619 AD. This was not your average debate about Calvinism and Arminianism for hours, a few hours on a Facebook forum. This is a years long forum where the ministers of dozens and dozens of churches from around the globe came together to deal with what was known as Arminianism. They knew that there was something sinister about this Arminian teaching that undermined what the Bible taught about sovereign grace. And so what did these churches do? They said, let's come together, let's have a synod, and let's deal with this issue. Let's put forth a positive statement as to what we believe about salvation. Mind you, it was the Arminians that first came up with their points, their Arminian points and what they believed about salvation. So really the five points were put together as a response. So here we go again, reactive. Put together as a response to the Arminian teachings in that day. Now Robert Godfrey wrote a really helpful book called Saving the Reformation. It's about the Synod of Dort. He writes, the Synod of Dort was in the first place theological in its concerns. It met to answer the Arminian doctrines and articulate the biblical alternative. In a profound sense, this synod saved the Reformation for the Reformed churches. While Lutherans would reject several elements of the canons, Calvinists saw clearly, now, now get this, that a proper understanding of election was necessary to protect the Reformation's grace alone. A proper understanding of Christ's atoning work was necessary to protect the Reformation's Christ alone. A proper understanding of the regenerating and preserving work of the Holy Spirit and of the Christian's comfort in these doctrines was necessary to protect the Reformation's grace alone and faith alone. Implicit in the canon's conclusions is their commitment to the Reformation's scripture alone as the only source of religious truth. Now the point is this, although the doctrines of grace are not synonymous with the gospel itself. In other words, you can uh, have a wrong understanding of this and still understand that you need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone to be saved and be saved. That's true. Nevertheless, they protect the gospel and they preserve the gracious character 
of salvation. So this is how the canons of the Synod of Dort were put together. First head of doctrine speaks of divine election and reprobation. If God elected some, it necessarily means he passed over others. The second head of doctrine, the death of Christ and the redemption of men thereby. How Christ secures the salvation of those whom God has elected. And then the third and fourth head of doctrine was actually put together under the heading, the corruption of man, his conversion to God and the manner thereof. And the last, the fifth head of doctrine is the perseverance of the saints. So you'll notice that it didn't start with the T, total depravity, it started with election, which actually makes a lot of sense because before anything ever happened, before man ever existed, God in eternity elected a people to redeem. But more or less, what we know today as Tulip is what was set forth in the canons of Dort. Now, I really quickly would just like to note how the canon, how the synod concluded. This was a deeply doctrinal discussion that lasted about a year. Godfrey then writes on May 29, 1619, the last activity of the synod was to gather in the great church of Dortrecht, that's why it's called Synod of Dort, for a worship service. The pastor there, Balthazar Lydius, who was also a delegate to the synod, preached the final sermon. His text was a most fitting conclusion to the work of the synod. And get, guess what? It was not a text that focused on any of the five Calvinistic answers to Arminianism. Rather, it was a text that celebrated the gracious character of salvation. Here from Isaiah 12, 1 to 3. May this be the preface to everything we are studying the next three weeks. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, you turned your anger away, that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. To quote Jonah, salvation is of the Lord. And the term Calvinist is really an unfortunate term, but we're forced to use it because that is how it is known. It's easier for us to use this language, but it's unfortunate because it implies that this is Calvin's doctrine. And we're about to see it's not. It's the church's doctrine because it is the Bible's doctrine, because it is Paul's doctrine and Peter's doctrine and Jesus's doctrine. And this is what God's word teaches. Now, I want you to understand also that we're actually going through a resource, and if, if you want, you can purchase this for yourself. It's a really, really helpful resource. It's called Pillars of Grace. It's the second volume from Stephen, Stephen Lawson's A Long Line of Godly Men. It's a great series. So the first volume, you know what he does? He goes from Genesis to Revelation and cha it traces the doctrines of grace through the entire Bible. And then in this volume two, he goes from the early church to the Reformation church, and he traces the doctrines of grace through that entire thing. It's a helpful resource, um, and we're using that a little bit as an outline. So I'm gonna be quoting from Lawson a little bit. So now we focus on the early church fathers from the first century to 500. So we'll look at the apostolic fathers, the apologist fathers, the African fathers, the Cappadocian fathers, and the Latin fathers. In each of these eras, we're going to look at one prominent figure from that era, and we'll take a look at what they teach. So beginning with the apostolic fathers, 100 to 150 AD, Lawson writes, the initial leaders in the early church were the apostolic fathers, who served during and immediately after the apostles' ministry. From the end of the first century until the middle of the second century, six men in particular distinguished themselves as leading apostolic fathers. Barnabas of Cyprus, Clement of Rome, we'll look at him, Ignatius, Papias, Polycarp, and Hermas. Some of them actually knew the apostles, while others were considered the first fruits of the apostolic ministry. These first pillars were the earliest Christian authors, and they formed a vital link between the apostolic era in the second century church. Now, you will not see, like I said, much systematization and exposition of scripture regarding the doctrines of grace in the apostolic fathers. 
Um, one of the reasons that that is, is because these guys simply like to quote scripture. You know, many have said that you could, you could restore pretty much the entire New Testament just through the quotations of the early church fathers alone. In other words, if we lost our manuscripts um, that we have, the actual copies of the New Testament writings, if we for some crazy reason, I mean, it's not probably gonna happen, but if we just lost them, they just disintegrated from the archives, we could pretty much restore the entire New Testament anyway with simply the, the quotations of the early church fathers. That's what they did. They just quoted and quoted and quoted scripture. They had other theological concerns which they would then dive deep into. You know, they had early Gnosticism that they were dealing with. So they were dealing with attacks from non-Christian worldviews that were coming inside. So in-house debates such as what we see, Calvinism and Arminianism, like that, weren't really the biggest deal back then. But even then, they write some interesting things which I think we will um, benefit from looking at. So Clement of Rome, this guy was born about AD 35. So he was born very much in the era of the apostles. Irenaeus, who lives later on, writes, Clement had seen the apostles and associated with them and still had their preaching sounding in his ears and their tradition before his eyes. So uh, many have said that he was most likely discipled by Peter and John. So obviously this guy had really good influence. He sat under some really good teaching. And what we're about to read should be striking to some people, especially those from, let's say, the Roman Catholic tradition, because Clement of Rome, they claim, is the fourth pope after Peter, the fourth bishop of Rome after Peter. And I wonder what they would say if they read these quotations, which clearly show that Clement believed in justification by faith alone, and other things as well. So the following quotations are from Clement's epistle to the Corinthians. You know, you should get your hands on that. It's available online because it'll just show you. The Corinthians were a, um, were, were, were a funny bunch because you know Paul wrote letters to the Corinthians rebuking them and stuff like that. So after Paul was beheaded and all those things, then you've got a pastor in Rome who is Clement and he has to write a letter to them as well. And guess what? Some more rebukes. All right. So get your hands on that. Read it. It's an entertaining, not, not an entertaining, but an informative letter. What did he believe about divine sovereignty? He writes, The heavens move at his direction and peacefully obey him. Day and night observe the course he has appointed them without getting in each other's way. By his will and without a dissension or altering anything he has decreed, the earth becomes fruitful at the proper seasons. So he saw God as one who was intricately involved in everything that ever happened in the world. He writes, By his majestic word, he established the universe. And by his word, he can bring it to an end. Who shall say to him, what have you done? Or what sh who shall resist his mighty strength? He will do everything when he wants to and as he wants to. And not one of the things he has decreed will fail. Everything is open to his sight and nothing escapes his will. With a view like that, with a biblical view of God's sovereignty like that, it's no surprise that we see bits and pieces of what we understand as the doctrines of grace in his writings. Now, I will warn you, the early church at this time did not have a very robust understanding of original sin and our inherited guilt from Adam. I mean, they believe bits and pieces of this, but it's not like, it's not like Louis Burkhoff or Bavink or something like that, okay? Again, they were convinced, uh, they, they were concerned with lots of quoting from scripture, not exactly um, the systematization that we're used to today. But he did believe that there was something wrong with man, of course, that's what the Bible teaches. He writes, we must take to heart, brothers, from what stuff we were created, what kind of creatures we were when we entered into the world, from what a dark grave he who fashioned and created us brought us into the world. And that's why he says, we're not justified of ourselves or by our wisdom or insight or religious devotion or the holy deeds we have done from the heart. So Clement believed that we couldn't justify ourselves, from the moment we came into this world, there was something very wrong with us, and therefore no religious deeds could ever justify us. What did Clement think about election? Well, he did call the Christians in the beginning of his letter, the elect of God. But this is not a surprise, because that is literally what the New Testament calls the church. 
That is what Peter calls the church in his letters, the elect of God. And he writes, Clement, we must then approach him with our souls, holy, lifting up pure and undefiled hands to him, loving our kind and compassionate father who has made us his chosen portion. Okay, not exactly clear, slightly ambiguous, you might say. As he comments on Psalm 32, Clement says, Happy is the man whose sin the Lord will not reckon. This is the blessing which, has, which was given to those whom God chose through Jesus Christ our Lord. To Him be the glory forever. Now again, that's just New Testament language. He's basically quoting New Testament there. How about the atonement? He writes, It was by the blood of the Lord that redemption was going to come to all who believe in God and hope on Him. Now, you could look at that quote, it could go both ways. It could go both ways. People could quote this guy and say, yeah, because God knew who was going to believe in him and that's why Jesus died specifically for those people. Well, he continues, by love all God's elect were made perfect. Without love, nothing can please God. By love, the master accepted us. Because of the love he had for us and in accordance with God's will, Jesus Christ our Lord gave his blood for us his flesh for our flesh, his life for ours. So he clearly limited the atonement, clearly. How about calling? What did he believe about how people are drawn to Christ? He says, the church of God which sojourneth in Rome to the church of God which sojourneth in Corinth, to them which are called and sanctified by the will of God through our Lord Jesus Christ and it is the will of God that all whom He loves should partake of repentance and so not perish with the unbelieving and impenitent. He has established it by His almighty will. Justification. This is a really clear quote. Pay attention to this. And so we, having been called through His will in Christ Jesus, are not justified through ourselves or through our own wisdom or understanding or piety or works which we wrought in holiness of heart, but through faith. Okay, people have this crazy idea because of misinformation that after the apostles died, Roman Catholicism took over and everything was work salvation and that is absolutely untrue. You see this, one of the successors of the apostles and he teaches justification by faith alone. He even says that this is how man has always been saved. Look at the last part whereby the Almighty God justified all men that have been from the beginning. Man has only ever been justified by faith alone. So, the point is, Clement affirms that God is absolutely sovereign. He has an elect people. Christ shed His blood for those people. Those people will surely come to Christ, and perhaps most clearly, they are justified through faith alone. That is the testimony of one of the prominent teachers of the first, second century church. Now the apologist fathers, from 150 to 250. Lawson writes, by the end of the second century, the Christian faith was becoming a compelling force within the Roman Empire. Remember, they were still heavily persecuted though, but they were growing. As a result, many of Rome's most profound thinkers were becoming followers of Christ. From their ranks arose the next wave of Christian leaders, men known as the Apologists, Justin Martyr, Tatian the Assyrian, Irenaeus of Lyons, Athenagoras, Artisides, Theophilus, Minicius, and others. These gifted Greek authors sought to present a sound defense of Christianity in the face of intellectual attacks and mounting persecution. As their title suggests, these apologists were brilliant defenders of the Christian faith, men who wrote against sophisticated philosophical attacks on the gospel. So as the church advances in early church history, now we're going to start to see doctrinal formulation. It's going to be a little bit more familiar to us because these apologists, if you will, were now concerned with dealing with attacks that were quite intellectual. So these guys came in and they dealt with some of the best philosophers that, that the Greeks and the Romans and the Gnostics had to offer. And often, as I've said, this theological formulation was done reactively. So these apologists spent a lot of time writing against what? The excesses of Greek philosophy, Gnosticism, and other issues. So here is Justin Martyr. 
who lived in 100 AD onwards. Eusebius writes about him, Justin was in his fullest prime in the time of these men, presenting the divine word in the garb of a philosopher and contending for the faith in his treatises. In this era, we begin to see that Christian theologians can go toe to toe with the best of the Greek and Roman philosophers. So these quotations that we're about to read mostly are from a really interesting dialogue that Justin Martyr had with a guy named Trypho the Jew. Trypho the Jew was classic orthodox. He was basically saying that because he was an ethnic Jew, he was the chosen people of God. And because of that, this Jesus and Messiah and Gentile church business was crazy talk. And so what did Justin do? He took the scriptures, he very charitably dialogued with Trypho the Jew. They had a back and forth and he was really gracious in applying biblical truth to their conversations and trying to show him, hey, 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 no, 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 no. Just because you're an ethnic Jew doesn't mean that you're saved. And just because I'm not a Jew doesn't mean I'm alienated. Look what the Bible has to say about these issues. And of course, at the end of the day, it was all about the gospel. So Justin just put forth the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. We see what he believed about depravity. He writes, he did not, Jesus, did not condescend to be born and to be crucified because he was in need of birth or crucifixion. He did it solely for the sake of man, who from the time of Adam, here's the development, had become subject to death and the deceit of the serpent, each man having sinned by his own fault. No one can perceive or understand these truths. He's talking about gospel truths, unless he has been enlightened by God and his Christ. As they deepen in their understanding of the nature of the inherited sin that we have from our forefather Adam, they were able to more deeply grasp as well and set forth the necessity of the Holy Spirit's illumination in order for us to even understand divine truth. He taught about election in the context of his conversation about um, the Jews and, and speaking to Trypho. He says, in the beginning, God dispersed all men according to nationality and language. And from all these nations, he chose for himself yours. He chose the Jews, a useless, disobedient, and faithless nation. So he acknowledged that. He goes, look, God has sovereignly chosen the nation of Israel. And then he continues, but listen, Trypho. And he showed that those of every nationality who were chosen have obeyed his will through Christ. So God has a portion among the Jews and he has a portion among the Gentiles as well. And these are God's chosen ones, the atonement. He believed that Christ also became man as we state and was born in accordance to the will of God the Father for the benefit of believers. So again, this is not a fully developed limited atonement as we call it today. At the very least though, Justin made it clear that the atonement only applies to those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And how do we come to Christ? Calling. <laughs> I love how he writes this. Do you gentlemen suppose that we could have grasped the meaning of these scriptural passages without a special grace from him who willed them? God needs to will it to happen for you to understand. We therefore were endowed with a special grace of hearing and understanding of being saved by Christ and of knowing all truths revealed by the Father. He saw that entire package as a special grace. Hearing and understanding, being saved, knowing the truth revealed by the Father, that is a special grace which God endows to people. And the point is, Justin's writings highlighted the necessity of the Spirit's work in order for a person to understand and even more to believe the gospel. Now guys, don't get it twisted. As we're going through these guys, they did have a lot of strange teachings as well. Okay, these guys were not perfect theologians. I don't want you to leave this study and go, oh man, Justin Martyr and Clement of Rome, they were Reformed Baptists, you know? No, it wasn't like that, okay? There's a diversity especially in early Christendom. Nevertheless, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing the seeds of a Protestant understanding of gospel truth. So now, 
We have the African Fathers from 200 to 375 AD. Lawson writes, by the third century, the North African coast of the Mediterranean had become a stronghold for the Christian faith. In the thriving Egyptian city of Alexandria, the school of Alexandria developed into a bastion for Christian truth. As the first center for the Christian learning, uh, for Christian learning, the school taught essential doctrines of the Christian faith along with Greek or Hellenistic reasoning, forming what became known as the Alexandrian theology. These guys were helpful because they realized that not all of philosophical thinking was inherently sinful. So they believed that they could actually engage with the philosophers by engaging with philosophy themselves, but ultimately turning to the scriptures as their source of truth. They were theologians, first and foremost. Another chief city of Roman Africa, Carthage, also became an important center for the teaching of fundamental Christian doctrine. So they fought against all kinds of heresies. Neoplatonism, Montanism, Manichaeanism, Arianism, denying the deity of Christ was one of the main issues, and even the deity of the Holy Spirit. In this era, we begin to see the sharpening of biblical doctrine and also a clear defense of original sin. Here is Cyprian of Carthage. Augustine, Saint Augustine, had a lot of good things to say about this guy, and that means a lot, because Augustine was obviously a brilliant theologian. He writes about Cyprian, that he is the most lauded commentator on the divine declarations, that loveliest of teachers, so memorable a teacher of the word of truth, and the most luminous doctor. Cyprian was one who preached, and this means a lot from Augustine, the true grace of God as it should be preached. That is the grace which no human merits precede. Now, here we will really see doctrines of grace kind of language. The depravity of man, he, he um, um, Augustine writes about, let us consider the judgment of God, which at the very beginning of the world and of the human race was passed upon Adam, who was unmindful of God's command and a transgressor of the law that was imposed. Then we shall know how patient we ought to be in this world. We who are born under the condition that we might struggle here under trials and conflicts, we are all bound and confined by the bond of this conscience. And he says that this is true even for newborn babies. The only thing that he, an infant, has done is that being born after the flesh as a descendant of Adam... He is contracted from that first birth, the ancient contagion of death. So we're dead from birth. You might even say we're dead from conception. We are born dead in sin. Election. He gets very clear. Believers are elected to hope, consecrated to faith, destined to salvation, sons of God, brethren of Christ, associates of the Holy Spirit, owing nothing any longer to the flesh. And Augustine loved this guy. Augustine loved quoting this guy. Augustine writes that Cyprian teaches predestination as preached by the apostles. He adds, this is what Cyprian saw with complete faith and declared with full confidence. And by it, he certainly proclaimed predestination to be most certain. And although... Augustine changed his views on things every now and then. And this is, get, this is common if you read um, church history. It's not uncommon to find contradicting statements from the same theologian. That's just the frailty of man. We're not infallible. About perseverance, though, he did write, and this is part of his thinking, there is nothing that can separate the union between Christ and the church. That is the people who are established within the church and who steadfastly and faithfully persevere in their beliefs. Christ and his church must remain ever attached. So we're always joined together. How about people who fall away? Now, you hear a lot of modern theologians talk about this in a QA. It's a question that many Christians have, but he was already addressing it. Those who withdraw from Christ have only themselves to blame for their own destruction. Whereas the church, which believes in Christ and holds fast to the teachings it has learned, never departs from him in any way. The true church remains in the house of the Lord. 
Lastly, the Lord who is the protector and guardian of his own people does not allow his wheat to be plundered from his threshing floor. It is only the chaff that can be separated off from the church. There's a difference between the wheat and the chaff. So we are now seeing continuity of thought regarding the so sovereign grace of God. These connections are important because Calvin's work on this topic involved heavily quoting these fathers. Calvin was basically quoting them and quoting them to prove to Rome that the Reformation was not a theological novelty. It is historic. Now, let's turn to the Cappadocian Fathers. 325 to 400, we're almost done. One more after this. Lawson writes, following the death of Athanasius, the focus of the church shifted to the eastern region of the Roman Empire. Three notable men known as the Cappadocian Fathers, Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Gregory of Nyssa, became the chief defenders of Christian orthodoxy. So these guys were in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and there was lots of Arianism that was now spreading, and God used them to really solidify the church's understanding of the Trinity. Let's get our bearings right. Emperor Constantine comes into power when? 312 AD. And he starts to Christianize the Roman Empire. He didn't do it officially yet, his successor did, but he, he makes it legal and he starts Christianizing the Roman Empire. And in 325, he called for a church council called the Council of Nicaea, because to be honest, it, was it really because he, was, he loved sound doctrine? Uh, I don't think so. It was, it was more of the Arian teaching against the deity of Christ was dividing the empire. He didn't want a divided empire. He was an emperor. So that was probably one of his great drives as to why he called for the Council of Nicaea. Now, it wasn't just him. It was everybody else that was concerned as well. But why was he for that? He wanted unity. Because of his love for Christ? Well, he would probably say that. But we might say it was because of his love for the power of the empire staying one and whole. 381, Council of Constantinople. That's another council that improved upon the Council of Nicaea. Our orthodox doctrine of the Trinity can be found in that document that came out of that. So, all of this is happening. And what was going on with the doctrine of the Trinity? Well, there were three views, main views, on the nature of Christ. There was the belief in homo usios, same nature. That Jesus the Son and God the Father have the same nature, same essence, same being. But then there was heterousios, that they had a different nature, that they were different beings altogether. And then there was homoousios, which seemed to be a healthy compromise, and Ar Arius himself settled for that, and that means similar nature. But for the orthodox defenders of the truth, that was not good enough. The Bible teaches that the Son and the Father are one in essence, one being, homoousios, same nature. And the kind of exegesis and systematic theology which was used to explain and defend the Trinity then benefited the development of the doctrines of grace. We see this in Gregory of Nazianzus. He earned the nickname the theologian. Now that's a good nickname. He was known as the theologian. In regard to depravity, he writes, all partake of the same Adam and were led astray by the serpent and slain by sin. For we believe that since we have fallen due to sin from the beginning and had been led away by pleasure as far as idolatry and lawless bloodshed, we need to be called back again and restored to our original state through the heartfelt compassion of God our Father. All man is lost. To be restored to God, they need to be brought back by the Father in His love. Election. I love this. This is, this is so relevant for today. Look at this. God does not delight in numbers. You count your tens of thousands, but God counts those who will be saved. You the immeasurable grains of sand, but I the vessels of election. Perhaps you have heard of a certain book of the living. Now this will preach. And of a book of them that are not to be saved, where we shall all be written 
or rather are already written. Effectual calling, we call it gift, grace, baptism, illumination, anointing, robe of incorruption, bath of rebirth, seal, everything honorable. He's talking about salvation in general and being brought to Christ. It is a gift because no offering is given for it beforehand. It's called grace because it's given to debtors. And lastly, he writes, the divine spirit created me and the breath of the Almighty taught me. And again, you will send forth your spirit and they will be created and you will renew the face of the earth, quoting scripture. He also fashions the spiritual rebirth. Be persuaded by the text. Nobody can see the kingdom of God or receive it unless he has been born from, the, uh, from above by the Spirit, unless he has been purified from his earlier birth. The same God who brought you into this world, physical birth, is the same God that must bring about the new birth if you are to enter into the kingdom of God. And so we see that a solid understanding of man's universal guilt under Adam is the necessary backdrop on which God's sovereign grace shines brightest. One last era in the early church, the Latin fathers from 350 to 500. Now, after Emperor Constantine was converted, um, he started Christianizing the Roman Empire and his emphasis on what it meant to be a Christian was not, you must be born again. His emphasis was more on just join, join the empire. You know, be baptized, join the group, join the religion. And so the unconverted began joining the church de facto or by default. And therefore there was spiritual compromise. It was said that in order to get everybody on the same page because it was one holy Roman empire that he wanted, Compromise was allowed. So you might say that a lot of the paganism and the idolatry that was part of the religions at that time were allowed to then creep into the Roman religion, which was now Christianity. And you begin to see the seeds being planted of looking to saints, of veneration of people apart from Christ, mediators and that kind of thing. Not full-blown Roman Catholic, but the seeds started entering, there was compromise. And remember, there was no separation of church and state. To be a Roman citizen, at one point, was to be a Christian, it's all the same thing. The state will basically make you a Christian. And Constantine, unfortunately, although he did some good, considered himself the Bishop of Bishops, and this is a, a good title right here, the 13th Apostle. And again, the Council of Nicaea was his desire to unify his empire. And in come the Latin fathers. We call them that because the Cappadocians wrote in Greek. History is moving forward now. These guys are writing in Latin. Lawson writes, the 4th and early 5th centuries witnessed the rise of the Latin fathers in the West, including Hilary of Poitiers, Ambrose of Milan, Jerome of Rome and Jerusalem, and Augustine of Hippo. These were called, these men were called Latin fathers because their theological works were written primarily in Latin, the language of the Western provinces of the Roman Empire. They were less concerned with the dangers of Gnosticism and now more focused on other areas of theology. The church was getting established in its Trinitarian doctrine and things like that. So now they could start dealing with other issues. Specifically, they turned their attention to the deadening effects of Adam's sin on the will of man. So after the apostles, this era right here reveals the closest link to Reformation theology in regard to the doctrines of grace. Please meet Augustine of Hippo. Roger E. Olson, who is a modern day theologian, a classical Arminian, acknowledges the importance of Augustine. He says, Augustine is the end of one era as well as the beginning of another. He is the last of the ancient writers and the forerunner of medieval theology. The main currents of ancient theology converged in him and from him flow the rivers not only of medieval scholasticism, but also of 16th century Protestant theology. We are indebted to guys like Augustine. The sovereignty of God was clear in his writings. The true God created the world and by his providence rules all he has created. He says that nor shall we think that human affairs in the case of infants are governed not by divine providence, or by, but by chance. 
when these are rational souls which are to be saved or condemned. And yet not a sparrow falls on the ground without the will of the Father in heaven. Now this is a strong statement right here because uh, this last one he writes, From Adam has sprung one mass of sinners and godless men, in which both Jews and Gentiles belong to one lump apart from the grace of God. If the potter out of one lump of clay makes the vessels unto honor and makes some vessels unto honor and another unto dishonor, it is manifest that God has made of the Jews some vessels unto honor and others unto dishonor, and similarly of the Gentiles. So God has His elect among all people, those who He has elected unto salvation and those whom He passes over. In regard to depravity, he writes, man's nature indeed was at first faultless and without any sin. Augustine really helps us understand the biblical doctrine of man. Sproul explains, R.C. Sproul, In creation, said Augustine, man had the posse peccare, the ability to sin, and the posse non peccare, the ability not to sin. So he helped us understand, before the fall, Adam had the ability to sin and the ability not to sin. That is free will. But after he exercised that free will to sin, the sin, the will was corrupted. The nature was corrupted. The man, man was put under a curse and sin affected our faculties. And now after the fall, man is always sinning. When you are born again, you are made able to sin, able not to sin. By the grace of God, we seek to obey Him. And when you are glorified, you will never sin. When you are glorified, you will always do what is right, for you will be in the perfect presence of God. And in these quotes, Augustine just extrapolates that doctrine and says that basically, look at that last one uh, um, under depravity. For it was in the evil use of his free will that man destroyed himself and his will at the same time. And then he makes an illustration. He says, you exercise genuine decision when you kill yourself, if you wanted to kill yourself. But after you killed yourself, I'm sorry, there's nothing you can do about it anymore. And he said the same thing about what man did with his will. He basically exercised his free will to kill himself spiritually, to sin. And I'm sorry, after that, there's nothing you can do about it anymore. You've deadened yourself in sin. Election. Some of his greatest writings were, of course, against what were known as the Pelagians or the followers of Pelagius. If you don't know what Pelagianism is, uh, it is free will on steroids. It is basically the teaching that man inherently has in themselves the ability to please God, to make the first move, to come to God and ultimately do something in order to merit salvation. He writes, For the Pelagians think, we can, through our own power, once we have received God's commandments, become, by the choice of our free will, holy and spotless in His sight in love, and they say, since God foreknew that this would be the case, He chose and predestined us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Isn't that a familiar argument? So the Pelagians were saying, who's the elect? Those whom God found out or foreknew would choose Him. He looked down the tunnels of time. And remember that Pelagianism was condemned by the church as a heresy. This is a pagan understanding of the mind of God. That God is able, God looks down the tunnel of time and finds things out. And on that basis, decrees things. That is not the biblical doctrine of election or the divine decree. I think that's quite clear. I'm going to stop right there. Um, I don't feel pressured whatsoever. Next week, we can pick back up on some of these quotations. But as you can see, Augustine was very clear with what we be he believed about the fallen nature of man, sovereign election, and the grace of God. So to conclude, just like today's theologians, these men were mere men who did not have an infallible grasp of Scripture. But they testify of God's providence in preserving the truths of sovereign grace in the early church. How encouraging is it to know that we come to many of the same conclusions that these brilliant theologians did? Truly, God has spoken clearly in His Word.